Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Cisco Umbrella's Inside Ransomware webinar. My name is Sergio Silver, and I work for the Cisco Cloud Security Team. And today, I am going to speak to you about ransomware. Now, ransomware has evolved and become probably the most profitable malware type in history. And obviously, it's becoming very, very serious situation for any, any sort of company or organization that's out there. So in this session, we're going to cover a couple of things, um, how ransomware is actually involved and what we know about it today, and how we see it mutate to basically predict the type of future attack that ransomware will be doing in the future, the best practices to protect your company, your employees, and your data, and how to use Cisco Umbrella as the best-in-class ransomware solution. Now, ransomware is fast becoming this ubiquitous security threat. Every day around the world, we see people receiving a page either identical or very similar to this, and this will ruin the entire day. And that's no surprise, as it's currently the worst possible problem any organization faces today. Nearly 40% of all businesses experiencing a ransomware attack in the past year, and the figure is even worse in the UK, where 54% of businesses have been targeted with such an attack. And here are a few examples I would like to cover on the evolution of ransomware. Not so long ago, ransomware started its life as a type of malware that would compromise end machines looking for Bitcoin. Yes, Bitcoin. And the reason for this is that you can no longer really mine for Bitcoins because the mining has become so complex and really, really expensive. So the attackers have had to resort to stealing them rather than mining them. However, this was not successful as, you know, people that have a lot of um, or a serious number of Bitcoins, they will store this off their computers and not on them in digital wallet, in the type of digital wallets that are out there. So the attackers had to change their strategy and they, had, and they basically, what they did is they found a new way of getting the Bitcoins and that is to encrypt data randomly in order to see what data means to the actual user. Sort of like a game of chance where the outcome is strongly influenced by some randomizing. At first, customers were held at ransom for their data, and that was you know, encrypted as part of the hard drive, which, which then expanded to encrypting the complete drives, and then the malware started uh, searching, obviously, for shares and encrypting those too. This had a massive impact to the organization when, when you think about the critical data that was being held at ransom. Needs to say a lot of small organizations that didn't follow best practices or the people and technology that failed them ended up paying hefty ransoms, but eventually some organizations actually never recovered and basically closed down. So we even had cases where, for example, hotels were held at ransom as a system that would allow people in and out of their rooms were held at ransom. So one of the more interesting ones, especially when you think about the, the impact of the Internet of Things, was dated in December 2016, we, where we had smart televisions being held at ransom. Think of the, the impact of this. A lot of businesses today use these smart televisions to do presentations. Worst, the worst case is the trust element. Imagine that you have a customer that you've been presented to and all of a sudden this page comes up demanding ransom. Uh, obviously, this would not go well with a customer, and you, you can imagine that uh, the trust would no longer be there. And finally, the popcorn ransomware. A variant of Lockheed ransomware that it ransoms your machine and demands that the user either pay the Bitcoin or nominate, yes, nominate two people to receive this ransomware so you can get the key to release your data. Now, this is psychological war games, as no one will nominate their friends or family. Well, I guess that obviously depends on how you feel about your family. But on a serious note, people who have no way out would nominate, obviously, their worst enemies rather than the closest family and friends. The problem that I've seen in the field is that a lot of people that end up paying ransomware will ultimately be ransomed again. 
Why? Well, it's like this. The people only decrypt the data that's important to them. And what happens is the malware that's still sitting on the system sees that it's meant to encrypt 60% of the data as a number, for example, and it only sees 40% of it uh, being encrypted, so it encrypts a further 20% so that it can meet that quota of what has been told in the algorithm. And once again, it might hit you know, data that's important to that person, and once again, if they haven't backed up that data, they'll pay that ransom. So my advice is, you know, obviously decrypt everything, whether it's important or not. So those who do not remember the past are condemned to repeat it, which brings me to the history of ransomware. So let's touch a little bit on this. So ransomware is not the type of malware that's been around, you know, just for the last couple of years. It's actually been around since 1989, uh, which was called the AIDS um, malware. But obviously, it was not as successful as it is today. Why? Well, think about the maturity of the internet at the time. Think about how the networks were connected internally. But most importantly, how many in interconnections did we have back in 1989? And then think about how work was a destination. And the internet was the only, only actually available at work. And for some, you know, for some people, obviously, would be have some internet from home from a remote access perspective. Now, the question is, why is ransomware so important for attackers? Well, let's consider Stuxnet, the Scotter attack that occurred back in 2010. Now, it's really important for you to understand how the attack is run and why the attacker prefers this type of attack to the traditional malware that is obviously out there. And the best way I can think that demonstrates this is to compare ransomware to Stuxnet. Now, Stuxnet was, to date, the most sophisticated malware attack that's ever been run. Yes, it was geopolitical, and yes, it had advocacy lawyers to guide uh, the target of the attack. But what I want to focus is the amount of code required for the specific attack. Consider that Stuxnet was over something like 15,000 lines of very beautifully well-coded code. So well-written that it had basically had something like four zero days coded into the actual malware. That's a lot of complexity. It took some very large security vendors a number of days to actually dissect that code. Now consider ransomware. Less than a couple of thousand lines of code an encryption model uh, or module, and then obviously the Bitcoin setup so that they can take payment to a specific wallet. That's it, nothing more, nothing less. Now let's go through the anatomy. You know, how does, you know, rans how does ransomware use DNS? Um, so let's look at this. If you consider all the strands of different types of malware, ransomware specifically, that's been you know, gliding on the internet for the last couple of years, you'll notice that from the green spot that the majority of them use DNS as that command and control, right? It's very transparent. If you think about a firewall, a firewall will check the integrity that it is a DNS packet. It doesn't check the destination it's trying to connect to, right? Then you consider that obviously there are ransomware that do definitely use IP. There's some that actually never use a command and control. And then there's obviously those that obviously sit in the, in the dark of the web known as the Tor networks. And then recently we've all come across WannaCry, which is taking basically the opportunist attack of people who don't have the time to patch their machines because they are very complex networks. And then obviously of organizations that failed to patch on time where they obviously went over and took on a vulnerability on the SMB version one protocol. So as you can imagine, the attackers themselves are just like any organization. They are very innovative in the way they do attacks. And this is one of the prime reasons that DNS is so fundamentally important to them because it's obviously transparent. And to give you a little bit more around the statistics around this, to prove the point of the DNS being used as a command and control. 
parameter, if you could call it, to do the attack. So in research done by Lankov, who's now part of Cisco, they found that 15% of command and control back, uh, callbacks actually bypasses ports, the web ports, port 80 and 443, the ports covered by your traditional web security systems. So you must likely have a gap in coverage and you're only really relying on your software gateways or, uh, or parameter security. And then Cisco conducted some additional research and we basically found that 91% of command and control rely on DNS. So by using Umbrella, you have the ability to block the vast majority of those command and control backs. So what about that 9%? Well, Umbrella can also block direct IP communications and even proxy traffic to block specific, UR, um, specific URLs. And let's consider the margins that our attackers have obviously um, made during the last couple of years. So just an example. So between January of 2015 and up to December of last year, 2017, the CSO online reported that the ransomware damage over the last two years has risen by something like 15 times to hit something like $5 billion in 2017 due to the downtime, the lost productivity and other overlooked costs. Now, when you consider that on, on, on 2016 alone, they made one, they became a one billion dollar business. Now they are five billion dollar business. Now, when you see the predictions that at this rate ransomware is on pace to become a ten billion dollar business, they've already hit five billion dollars. So they are still very active, and they're still obviously getting a lot of business from this. And then let's look at Bitcoin. When you think about all the attacks that have run over the last couple of years, Bitcoin has been fundamentally the currency that they want to be paid in. So obviously, there's been sort of a, a counter effect to this because the whole process of going after or creating ransomware was to go after and get Bitcoin. So by picking the currency of Bitcoin as the currency of choice, they have actually increased the value of the Bitcoin. And the value of Bitcoin has gone immensely up, as you can see from obviously the chart and it's peaking and it's, it's valid at about 10,000 pounds, I think today for one Bitcoin. And it's hit something like 15,000 pounds per Bitcoin in the last couple of years. So they've been very clever in the way they've architectured the way they've run this attack and to obviously make that currency even more valuable. Now, this is the problem, right? Customers can be taken hostage by malware that locks up critical resources, right? This is really bad. The effect of that is it's catastrophic for any business at any time, right? But here's the scary thing. If you think about the way attacks have run, so every 10 seconds today, you have a consumer that gets hit with ransom. Uh, if you think about it back in 2016, it was every 20 seconds. And then every 40 seconds, you've got a company that gets hit with ransomware. That is obviously reduced the time to impact because it used to be every two minutes in the first quarter of 2016. So there's obviously been some immensely bad hits on this. And this is all due to the way we work. The way we work has changed. In fact, 49% of workforce today is mobile. And in a recent survey, we found that 82% of respondents actually admitted that they don't actually use VPNs all the time. Obviously, when you start to think about cloud adoption and SaaS app usage to expect that increase, well, in the next two years, we can expect a semi increase in that. And obviously, that's also down to the reduction of using VPN because if you go direct to cloud without having, without having to connect to a main office, that obviously lifts the experience of the user. And then you've got obviously the 70% of enterprise branch office today that actually go direct to the internet. They, you know, bandwidth has become a lot cheaper. They, the links out to the internet obviously cost them a lot less. And it's also giving, if they are a cloud-based strategy within that organization, they're gonna to want to go directly to the internet. So obviously the problem that you have there is that organizations have a very limited visibility and control for that sense of data and apps that's in the cloud. And then obviously security must evolve to address these challenges. 
and to protect this modern enterprise. And it has to protect users wherever they work. Like infrastructure, apps, and data, it has to shift to the cloud. So Cisco Umbrella, let's give a little bit of an overview. So in today's cloud-connected world, the way we work has changed, as we've seen in the previous slide, but obviously security has not, right? So let's look at how the attack is actually run. So number one, patient zero. That refers to the first machine that's infected with a malicious code. There's obviously a common misconception that the attack lifecycle actually starts with patient zero. Um, so once patient zero is infected, the attacker does a token expansion uh, to obviously a similar segment. Uh, then they wide scale this expansion to all and weeks later, traditional security vendors then catch up. They reverse engineer the code and obviously then create a signature that they then push out to their customers in the form of an update. But looking at the timeline in more detail, before an attack is actually launched, servers have to get spun up in the internet or the dark of the internet. The domains have to be registered. The IPs and ASNs have to be allocated. And although threats continue to increase in sophistication, you'll find that attackers often reuse the same infrastructure in multiple attacks, leaving behind obviously these cyber footprints for us. Now consider that they obviously like any organization, they're not gonna buy new kit every single year. So obviously we'll reuse that kit and that's fundamentally the point there. Um, and then obviously Umbrella uses this data from our global network and statistical models to uncover the information so that it can stop the attacks before that patient zero is actually hit. So where would Umbrella basically protect you? So Umbrella will protect you. Uh, it will basically block those requests um, for any sort of domain that's hosting an export kit or a domain that's been compromised to obviously host the export kit or my advertising. You know, you go to a specific site, you see this advert come on, you try and click all over the page until it actually forces you to go and click on the advertisement. And before you know it, you've got the export that goes down onto your system. Um, uh, Umbrella also blocks that DNS request, which would lead to that malware download. That's all based on what we call the phase two of an attack. Phase two meaning that you'll be sent to a command and control infrastructure. And within that command and control infrastructure, you can use any domain that would have maybe a, the same variant of malware or various different types of malware to see where it gets the best amount of victims. And that's all based on what we would call beta testing, right? So they beta test it in the, in the, in the wild and they're obviously gonna catch, um, you know, fish as they say with that. Now with 100% uptime since 2006, and no added uh, latency. Umbrella provides this complete visibility into the internet activity across all locations, devices, and users, categorized by the type of cloud service, web content, or even security threat. And we can even identify attacks by comparing the, you know, your block request to the rest of the world so we can give you a baseline. We handle, on average, 125 billion requests a day. That's over 90 million users that use our product, over 15,000 different customers across the enterprise, across 160 countries across the world. Our efficacy is based on that we discover three new or three million new daily new domain names. We then identify 60,000 of daily, those daily malicious destinations as being malicious, and we can enforce blocks on seven million malicious destinations while resolving to the obviously resolving DNS alone. Now, one of the key things I wanna show you, uh, one of the things we are is very transparent. So if you log in today into system.opendns.com, you'll actually see we're doing on average, as of the 10th of January, we're doing on average about 137, 138 billion requests a day. Now, when you, take, when you consider the way DNS works, this is fun, I'm gonna show you how we protect your infrastructure. So with DNS, solution, uh, sorry, with DNS resolution, we can make many threat discoveries. First, any device will send the DNS request to Umbrella. We analyze those requests to detect many types of threats and anomalies. For example, we can actually determine if a system is compromised based on the types 
of requests it's making. If it's, a, if it's a device that's just making requests to a number of known bad domains, it's more likely to be compromised. The user patterns, we also do, you know, basically take the user request patterns across our user base to give us this great insight into potential threats, so predicting. In the second part, you'll see that we've got the global cache that doesn't contain any non-expired response to a request. We then recursively contact all the named servers that are authoritative for the domain requested. And this process basically gathers the authoritative logs for virtually every domain daily, which we use to find newly staged infrastructures and obviously any, any other types of anom anomalies that are out there. We then combine this DNS layer visibility with the WHOIS records, the BGP routes, Cisco AMP, and other sets of, of real time um, to form this massive graph database. And then we continuously run our statistical models, aka our machine learning, uh, against this. More than a reputation score, we analyze both the historical and live events to statistically score the guilt of a domain and the IP that are being part of that attacker's infrastructure. We determine guilt using these three approaches known as inference, association, and pattern. And then we build a lot of models, or we've built already a lot of models, uh, but as part of this, we obviously do this live DJ uh, prediction and obviously send a rank in addition to these three new, these, not these three new, but these three categories that we use to obviously analyze and detect and predict these different types of attacks. We obviously that first layer of defense. Whenever you do any sort of request to the internet, the first thing it's going to do is say, where does this domain live? And that's what DNS primarily does. It tells you where it is. It's the white pages of the internet. So it will send you to that specific domain. So Umbrella acts before any sort of file execution or any sort of IP connection. DNS is critical to the internet. It's basically the Achilles heel of the internet to a large extent if you don't protect it because it's used by all devices. It's port agnostic, right? So we can see everything. We can see things like the type of cloud services that you use, the type of devices that are connecting to your network, things like refrigerators, vending machines, thermostats. All these make DNS requests out to find out where the data center is so they can update the statistics. So we will protect you as a first line of defense. And by doing that, we protect you from reaching any malware infected uh, sites, any command and control backs if you're already infected, but also in addition to that, phishing. And also as a side note, one of the key things that I want to mention here is that Fish Tank is one of Cisco's companies where we hold the biggest repository of phishing um, samples across the globe. So let's cover this fairly quickly. So protection and visibility for all activity anywhere, and that's not a joke. Because if you think about it, DNS, we see everything, right? Umbrella provides this visibility and protection for all of your internet traffic. Umbrella provides the visibility needed to protect internet access across all offices and devices and networks and roaming uh, devices because we don't just protect you on the network. We also protect you when you're off the network when you're using the client or any connect client on, on the device. We provide this visibility to sanction and unsanctioned cloud services. So you can uncover you know, services that are being used, whether it's services you know about or services you might not know about, or even those type of services which you might have actually put into a policy that tells the user that they're no longer allowed to use it, where they still are using things like, for example, Dropbox, that's not a sanctioned application used by the organization. And, as tech, and obviously, as attackers try to infiltrate networks with different tactics, Umbrella, also provides us coverage and visibility for all ports, right? And obviously, as the internet moves towards more along the lines of the HTTPS, then more destinations will require the SSL decryption uh, to effectively see and block. And Umbrella provides visibility and protection for those HTTP, uh, destina HTTPS destinations without adding any latency. So Umbrella is built into the foundation of the internet. Right, so we we basically sit on the internet, and on its very basic 
basic form of, of action is you use or make a DNS request. If the DNS's request is going to, say, for example, google.com, that's a safe destination, we will resolve that destination for the user. However, if your user is trying to get to abc.ru.com, which we know is a malicious destination, we will send back a block page to the user stating that we blocked that connection based on it's a malicious destination or a phishing destination or a command and control or content. Because we also at the domain level can do content filtering. So we can do content filtering across a number of different categories, ranging between 60 and 100 categories today. So we provide this enforcement without any sort of delay. Umbrella uses that DNS to enforce the security. And then when Umbrella receives that DNS, it obviously identifies whether it's a safe or a bad connection. So the safe request, we will write that connection, like I said. And then obviously anything that's unknown or risky, we route that connection to our cloud-based proxy for deeper inspection, which is what we call the intelligent proxy, or what I call the security proxy. Because what we'll do is then, transparent to the user, we will do further investigation of that domain to prove that it's either benign and safe or to prove that it's malicious. So we will find things like you know, URLs and scan them and see if they're malicious. We look for files and we scan them using our antivirus and anti-malware engines used by Cisco AMP. And if, for example, it comes back that it's benign, then to the user, all they're going to do is get the, the permit to go to that specific domain. However, if we find that that domain is not safe and it's malicious, then the user will receive a block page stating that they're no longer allowed to, well, they are not actually allowed to connect to that page and they never make that connection to that page. The important thing here is from a Cisco architectural plane, if you're using um, technologies like Cisco AMP, both for networks and for endpoints, you know, let's say we discover a new file on a new domain that is obviously being scanned by our sandbox and we can see that it's malicious, then that information will go up into the cloud and we'll, set, we'll build a new signature or hash for it. And any customer that has AMP for networks, AMP for endpoint, will start scanning. And if they see that hash, they'll block it, but also scan and go back retrospectively in time to see if they can find that specific hash or a match in that and go remediate that device. So in the intelligent proxy, we are able to do things like Obviously, like I've stated, scanning files with antivirus, anti-malware engines, uh, checking the destination it's going to, obviously doing things like sandboxing if we do find something that we've never seen before. All of that is done transparently. And in, in addition to that, we can also do things like safe search as an additional capability to stop your users from seeing some of the things that you're already blocking from a content perspective. Now, we also protect users both on and off the network. And that's very important. If you think about today, the way people work, obviously a lot of people work away from the office. So they're vulnerable if they're not having this always on VPN and always on VPN is not always the right decision when you have a strategy of cloud because you're sending the users all back, using that bandwidth back up to your organization, hairpinning them out, and that obviously causes some delays and, and obviously not a great experience. So with our clients, whether you're connected to a VPN or not, we will always provide this layer of protection using DNS, which means if they're trying to get to any sort of domains that are outside of your you know, parameters of control within your network, they will still be blocked from getting to those categories. Or you can actually build a policy that makes it a little bit more uh, loose and allow them to connect to certain other categories while they're off the network. But, it, but basically the point here is that you can provide a layer of security wherever they go, and that's fundamentally important. We've obviously scaled this out. Um, you'll see now that we've partnership with Apple, and with Apple we've got an iOS connector that was released just um, early uh, or mid-December, which means that if you are a company that hands out iOS tablets or iOS phones, we're able to provide protection for those devices wherever they go. So that they can, whether they're on a 4G network, 3G network, whether they're connected to the corporate wireless, whether they're connected to the guest wireless or a public wireless, we will provide that layer of protection to those devices 
wherever they go. So in summary, so Cisco will obviously, Cisco Umbrella will prevent connections before and during the attack. Uh, and basically will stop that exfiltration or download of the ransomware. And basically with this, we are able to protect you from malicious code that's been designed to bypass mm. DNS. And we use this, and we can also do this by obviously IP connection. So sometimes the best hiding place is the one that's in plain sight. And I'm gonna dig into that. Ultimately, with a combination of our data and statistical models, we are able to see attacks as they staged and how attackers' infrastructure is related. And I'm gonna give you a real world example. So this is a bottle of Chateau Magar 1787. It is one of the finest bottles of wine ever produced. But what makes this bottle even more interesting is that it happens to be the most expensive bottle of wine ever to be sold. It was sold for about half a million dollars. And now, as you can imagine, if you're in the business of selling these very expensive, you know, bottles of alcohol, like, for example, you know, we're going to touch on a specific site, um, you can basically, you basically hold an elite database of very wealthy com uh, customers, right? So you could also imagine that the site was setting for a, what could be the perfect targeted attack, because essentially what's happening here is that was the domain that had been hijacked and hosted to this exploit kit was targeting anyone that was buying this expensive alcohol. They would effectively walk away with obviously a very bittersweet remembrance within a couple of days when the exploit kit runs. And of course, it connects to the command and control and then downloads that payload and their data would be held at ransom. So this is, we're going to touch on the actual um, malware install domain. But effectively, what I'll show here is obviously, the, if you take, for example, the infection mechanism, the JSON file, the emails that obviously can be sent to the users, you can obviously make that DNS request, which then obviously sees that ransomware being downloaded. So let's take it, take a look at it from an investigate perspective. So Cisco Investigate is the tool that we use in order to um, take that intelligence that we pick up and to do some analysis against this. Right. So you can see here that this information is based on the malware installed at Wang. Uh, if that name is not a giveaway or an arrogant expression of the attacker's attitude towards the victims, um, it, it's really pretty funny to a large extent. Uh, but we notice that almost immediately that the activity towards this domain goes from near nothing to a large number of requests. And you can see that right over here. Right. So, and this happens within minutes. We can also see that the domain is actually registered to a Russian alias. And we can see that this Russian alias has obviously registered something like 80 domains. But what's key that you'll notice is that those other those 80 domains, you find that 80 of them are actually malicious, right? We also observe that this domain was tagged by our system as a malware payload distribution point about two days before ransomware uh, or ransomware tracker, which is a, another tool that you can find on the internet that tagged this domain as malicious. And then here is the relationship, right? So the relationship between the malicious payload domain and the domain that's actually selling that expensive alcohol because the algorithm that performs the co-occurrence states that requests made at a global scale within a specific time span, other than just before or after, and even sometimes in some occasions during, the requests made to this malware install here, this malware install, that 100% of the time, the requests are also being made to my favorite alcohol site. Now let's dig in a little bit into one of our proprietary algorithms, the co-occurrence, which I just touched very lightly on. So let's look at this in more depth. Whenever someone makes a DNS request, the co-occurrence rank model identifies what other domains are queried before or after even during that short time span. 
Identifying domains that have a higher current scores can highlight the connection between the domains regardless of what IP or network they're hosted on. So let's consider, for example, if the two domains, the c.com and d.com, are frequently visited right before or after malicious domain x.com, this may mean that c and d are possibly malicious domains as well. They are domains that are obviously guilty by inference. But what does it mean in the larger scope? If customers use our investigate product in the event of an attack, security analysts are able to actually piece together the malicious domains that are all tied into the same attack and get the most complete view of that attacker's internet infrastructure. The co-occurrence even enable an, uh, the analyst, uh, analysts to stay ahead of the attacks and proactively block additional related and suspicious domains before the network is actually compromised. That's a pretty powerful algorithm on its own. And this is what the innocent site looks like. This is obviously a real domain, so please do not go and type that into your browser. I do not re recommend it in any way or form. So you can query uh, Cisco and Brothers Investigate to gain these additional insights to the attacker's infrastructure and see what relationship is between domain IPs and malware and this is exactly what we've actually done here. When we look at this graphical representation, which is based on our open source uh, software called um, Open Graffiti, it's, you can find it on GitHub. Um, it was actually written by one of our researchers as part of his uh, PhD thesis. And we can see here, we can see the following data represented here, right? First and foremost, domains in red are bad, right? That's why they're being blocked, okay? So red is bad. We then obviously see the co-occurrence, right? Because there's malware installed and there's obviously qualitate.jp. We see the relationship between that and we observe that the domains share the same infrastructure and, the share, and obviously the same malicious IP addresses and obviously the same name server infrastructure, right? So we can see here in yellow, domains share the same infrastructure. And then we can also see the same type of name servers that they're all sharing as part of the attack. So in summary, this is the current malware distribution point. We expose the attacker's IP, the name server infrastructure that is actually hiding in plain sight, which additionally gives us the ability to predict the attacker's next move, sort of like a chess championship. So there are the next malware distribution points. You can see that they've got these in reserve. So if this distribution points don't work, they can pretty much fall back to these. And then obviously we expose all the name servers and IPs to predict those next moves. And then one of the key things I wanna highlight. So this is obviously VirusTotal. Um, as part of the investigate product, you can pivot into obviously into VirusTotal. But what you can see here is something that's very fundamental. VirusTotal picked up this attack basically a day after we did, right? And that just shows you how effective these algorithms actually are in predicting and containing and obviously protecting your infrastructure from the, from the attacks. So what sets us apart from other competitors? Well, we are the fastest and most reliable cloud infrastructure. When customers connect to the cloud security platform, the performance is obviously critical. It cannot break or slow down internet connections. And since our network was established in 2006, we've had 100% uptime. That is all based on, we use Anycast, uh, BGP Anycast, which will always route you to the closest data center. And also at the same time, every time something fails, it'll just reroute it to the next data, uh, to the next data center using BGP Anycast IPs, which are the same advertised IPs across the world you just find in the closest hop to that specific IP address with the best experience. Um, other things, it's not just that we have the peering relationships with over 600 ISPs, which allows us to obviously resolve requests for, uh, faster, but most customers actually report a boost in speed. And one of those customers was Cisco. So when Cisco obviously in, um, switched on Umbrella to our corporate environment, no one could tell the difference apart that you could see that the pages are coming up quicker, which is an additional bonus. And we see this almost every single customer that we, we enable. It's obviously the most open platform. 
right? Leveraging our bi-directional API, customers can obviously easily integrate with Umbrella uh, with the existing tools to obviously automatically add to our platform or enhance another system, extending protection and enhancing information. We obviously have the most predictive intelligence. Uh, unparalleled intelligence enables us to uncover those malicious domains, IPs and URLs. Um, uh, they even used to, in, the, in the attacks itself. Uh, easiest deployment, there's no hardware to install or software to manually update. The customers just leverage the existing uh, Cisco footprint to provision thousands of network devices and, and obviously, you know, laptops, endpoints, whatever the case may be. And obviously, the last one, broadest coverage of malicious destinations and files. Not only do we have the power of the malicious domains and IPs that we had in Umbrella, before, but we also have the coverage of malicious files that are attempted to be downloaded from risky domains. And this is through the power of actual Cisco AMP, which we, we can basically pivot in and see what that file is, is able to do. So the only thing worse than being blind is having the sight, but no vision. Now the story of the bottle of wine did not have a good ending as the person that bought that bottle of wine would be invited to events to show off this most expensive bottle of wine in the world uh, until one dinner, whilst they sat at a table, a waiter accidentally actually knocked that bottle of wine over and it smashed obviously into a thousand pieces. I guess the lucky point here is that the owner had the foresight to have this bottle insured and by doing so, he managed to at least recover half of his money back but not everyone has this foresight in order to cover themselves when the risk of things going wrong is pretty high. So consider the following numbers. Why are these numbers significant? Well, over a short period of time, usually between 14 or 30 days, we're seeing these high numbers of threats across a lot of POVs that we run across a lot of numbers of customers. And even though the majority of these organizations are running a defense in depth strategy using a mix of firewalls, antivirus, and security tools, with the umbrella pub, we can actually provide insight into the threats and attacks you're currently missing, right? So join more than the 15,000 businesses who rely on Cisco Umbrella and stop your threats earlier. I'd like to thank you for your time today. Um, it's been a pleasure and an honor and uh, I'll open this up to some questions.